Ladies and gentlemen, friends, David Walton. Clearly, I don't have a unique enough name. Um, there's also a David Walton who is a uh, British member of parliament who uh, died from a flesh eating disease of some kind. I'm, I'm also not him. You were wrong! Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you. 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 The, the portion of the book that I'm going to be reading is uh, the, the main character is uh, he would like to work for the NSA. His father worked for the NSA and it has been his lifelong dream and he's going to uh, apply there and uh, it is through the, it, through the uh, course of working for the NSA that he's going to get a sense for just how much this fungus is uh, spreading throughout the world and affecting world politics and thought and all kinds of things. But at the moment, he is just trying to get a job that he would like to get. So, I pulled up to the NSA at 7 a.m., two hours early. They let me in, which was fortunate, because it was one of the coldest days of the year and my Nissan's heater didn't work anymore. The security guard watched as I untangled two scarves, gloves, a hat, and a coat and put them on the conveyor belt to be x-rayed. My wallet and keys followed them, and I stepped through the metal detector without a hitch. Finally, they gave me a bright red and white striped badge with visitor, one day only, stamped on the front in two-inch high letters. I sat in a molded plastic chair next to a vending machine. I was hungry, having skipped breakfast to make sure I had time to find where I was supposed to go. But the vending machine ate my dollar bill without relinquishing my chosen candy bar. The metal, metal spiral turned but the bar clung tenaciously to its position, refusing to fall. The next customer would probably get two for his money, but I was out of cash. I thought about shaking the machine, but I thought that might not give the right impression to my potential employees. employers. <laughs> I slouched in the chair, watching a flat screen television mounted on the wall that was set on endless loop. It showed a two minute video extolling the virtues of the NSA. It was called Information is Power, and it featured clips of high-tension battle scenes and a deep male voiceover saying things like, intelligence saves lives on the battlefield, and we protect our nation's borders through global cryptologic dominance. The first time, I thought it was awesome. By the fifth time, I had it memorized. By the tenth, I had fallen asleep. I woke up at 9.05 with a stale taste in my mouth and a sense of panic, which only intensified when I realized my name was being called. The lobby, which had been empty, was now full of candidates. I thanked the receptionist who was calling my name and rushed down the hallway she indicated. My interview letter said I would be interviewed in room 32 by a Ms. Shaughnessy Brennan. I pictured a red-haired Irish woman, her fiery locks tied back and a merry twinkle in her eye. When I peeked into the room, however, a young black woman <laughs> sat there with her arms crossed, wearing a scowl. Um, hello, I said. Neil Johns? I halted. Yes? You're late. Oh, um, my paper said a uh, uh, Ms. Brennan? That's me. Right, sorry, I, I just thought you didn't think there were any black women in Ireland? No. Her voice was steel, and I now realized there was a bit of an Irish flavor to her vowels. Apologies, I said. She stood to shake my hand. She was young and fit, dressed in black slacks and a loose green blouse, with long hair twisted into tight braids and pulled back in a silver clasp. Her handshake was businesslike and cold. I sat down and tried to smile. Shaughnessy, that's a lovely name. Her look impaled me to the chair. <laughs> After that, it only got worse. She asked me nothing about the World War II era ciphers I'd invented in my spare time, nor did she quiz me on famous cryptological cryptologists of history, which I would have knocked out of the park. There's a certain kind of person I can impress with charm and a winning smile, but Shaughnessy Brennan was not one of them. 
Her baleful gaze didn't falter, no matter how many witticisms I attempted, and soon I stopped trying. I sensed that my dream of following in my father's footsteps was about to die. Her accent was beautiful, light and musical, and soon I found myself listening to the sound of her voice instead of what she was saying. Mr. Johns? Uh, yes, I'm sorry, I, I was thinking. You do realize, she said, that you applied to the Computer Science Division of Signals Intelligence? We do large-scale computing. Practically everyone in this division has advanced degrees in computer science. You don't seem to have any formal computing education at all. I'm pretty good at math, with three failed attempts at a degree to show for it. I shrugged. Signals intelligence seemed like my best shot. I don't know anything about network security, and I haven't really studied any foreign languages. She frowned. Your resume says you know Portuguese. Well, yeah, I kind of grew up in Brazil, so Portuguese is easy. I know a little Spanish, too, and, and I can get by in Tupi Guarani. But you don't know any foreign languages, she said. <laughs> I wasn't counting those, because I learned them as a kid. I haven't learned any recently, as an adult, she raised an eyebrow. Which, granted, hasn't been very long. I pushed on, rambling now. Uh, I mean, I don't know any of the really important languages, like Arabic, or Russian, or Chinese. I'm guessing you don't get much signals traffic in Tupi Guarani. Her face was impassive. Let's talk about your school record. I would have rather not, but it didn't seem helpful to say so. It says here that over the course of three years, you have managed to be expelled from MIT, Princeton, and Carnegie Mellon. She looked at me over the top of my resume. An impressive feat, I suppose, but not in a good way. <laughs> I was young then, I said. It was a long time ago. She squinted at me. How old are you now? 21. <laughs> she riffled through the papers in front of her. You started at MIT when you were 16, she said. You were expelled a year later. Admitted to Princeton at 17 and expelled a year after that. Carnegie Mellon at 18 and that time you lasted only two months. Her eyebrows asked the question. That last one wasn't my fault, I said. I thought the university president was embezzling funds. I did a probability analysis based on the donation profile of similar schools, the number of attending students, and the published scholarship numbers, and the report of available capital I happened to see on his secretary's desk. But nobody was going to believe me without evidence. I had to break into his office to prove it. <laughs> I take it you were mistaken? I shrugged. Sort of. The embezzler was the provost. She regarded me with an unreadable expression. Do you have a problem with authority? <laughs> I felt the blood rushing to my face. I was getting tired of her raised eyebrows and barely veiled disdain. How much did a degree and a neat resume really prepare someone for a job? The Alan Turings and Claude Shannons of the world had been eccentric, inventive, forceful people, rule breakers. The people at Bletchley Park and Room 40 didn't stop to check boxes. They got the job done, no matter what the cost. This NSA seemed more interested in writing procedures and creating flashy videos than in saving the world. I might not be a cookie-cutter candidate, I said, but I'm more than qualified. I belong in the NSA. She drummed her fingernails on the desk for a moment, thinking. Then she pushed her papers into a stack and wrapped them on the tabletop to square the edge. It was a dismissal. I'm sorry, she said. You're obviously a pretty smart guy, but we don't hire candidates without at least a bachelor's degree. I know that's your policy. I was hoping that you'd make an exception, she sighed. I guessed that interviewing candidates wasn't her usual job, and she was anxious to get back to whatever it was. And why is that, she said. I squared my shoulders. Because I care. Because I know that every war, every battle, every skirmish over trade rights and clear waterways is won and lost by intelligence. When I attack a problem, I won't quit until I solve it. 
Nobody in this building will work as hard at this as I will. It takes more than just ambition. You need to finish your education. I'm a quick study. Anything I don't know, I'll learn on the job. You're too young. If you don't mind me asking, I said, how old are you? <laughs> it was a cheeky question, and I thought it might get me thrown out of the room, but it actually evoked the first hint of a smile. I'm 24, she said. Unlike you, however, I actually graduated with a degree in computer science from the University of Maryland, and I've been working here for three years. And they have you interviewing unlikely candidates? <laughs> Her expression soured. It's a temporary thing. It's something my manager usually does, but she was unavailable. She handed a sheet of paper across the table. It was maybe 30 rows of unreadable letters and numbers in five character groups. Under each row was a blank line. I assumed it was an encrypted text, and the blank lines were to write the plain text message. Now you're talking, I said. She pressed her mouth into a line. Look. This is the practical portion of the interview. You can try it if you want. Her tone of voice communicated that I shouldn't bother. But you've already made your decision, is that it? I don't make hiring decisions. I'm a software engineer, not a manager. I just report on my impressions of your technical qualifications. I'm pretty sure the only reason you got an interview at all is because my manager saw something interesting about your resume. Don't ask me what. If she wants to offer you a position, or call you back for another interview, she will. Okay. She indicated a computer on the table to my right. There's a file in the home directory with the same encrypted message. When you've got it solved, copy it down under the sheet of paper. Her slim shoulders gave a shru slight shrug. They still like their hard copy around here. She stood, gathering her folder and handbag. I'll leave you to it. Good luck, Mr. Johns. Do most people solve it? She met my gaze. Most competent ones, yes. She left me alone in the room. I pressed the power button on the computer. Nothing happened. It was just as well. I felt more comfortable with a pen and paper in hand than typing numbers into a spreadsheet array. And I'm going to skip a bit where he's actually working on solving the, uh, the puzzle. When I emerged from my cave, the lights were turned low and the hallway was empty. I peeked into rooms until I found Shaughnessy Brennan hunched wearily over a terminal, typing. Long day, I said. She looked at me in surprise. Are you still here? I held up the paper. Solved it, I said. The last of the candidates went home hours ago. My heart sank. I guess I'm a little rusty. I did get the answer, though. She sighed. Fine. She held out a hand for the paper, which I passed over. She glanced at it briefly, then set it on the desk. I'll add it to your file. Did you certify completion on the web page? Web page? The portal, I mean. When you logged in and accessed the decontription tools, the last step was to certify that you'd successfully completed the test. Some people forget that step. Uh, I didn't use the computer. She stared at me, eyes hard. The computer, in the interview room, for the practical exam. I, I never turned it on. I, I hit the power button and nothing happened, so I just ignored it. So how did you decrypt message? I shrugged. Pen and paper? I felt a glimmer of hope. If she'd been expecting me to use the computer, then maybe she wouldn't hold my slowness against me. Not that I type any faster than I write, but there might have been tools, MATLAB or something, or at least a calculator, that would have sped the process a little. Without changing expression, she stood and walked past me. I followed her back to the interview room. She stopped short when she saw the table, strewn with pages and pages of calculations from my failed attempts. She crossed to the computer and hit the power button as I had done. Nothing happened. She followed the power cord from the back into a snarl of cables behind the table and found the plug dangling loose beside an outlet. The outlet was covered with a wide strip of masking tape and a sign that said, Outlet loose. Maintenance notified. Do not use. She straightened and looked at me, her expression still suspicious. Feeling foolish that I hadn't thought to check the plug, I shrugged. Sorry, I, I like pen and paper. I, I thought that would be allowed. 
The computer has a web portal that introduces you to several decryption tools, she said. It assumes a knowledge of Java or C, but requires no knowledge of cryptography techniques. Most competent programmers can put it together in half an hour and find the answer. I was feeling really stupid now. I didn't know. I, I thought the computer just had the file with the ciphertext and maybe a calculator or something. She picked up one of my pages of calculations, examined it, and set it down again. She shook her head. You really decrypted a Playfair cipher by hand? Now she was laughing at me. It was probably a story she would put in her repertoire to tell future candidates about the idiot who spent all day solving it on paper instead of checking the plug. It was a misunderstanding, I said, and I would have had it done faster if I hadn't started with a vignette. I have never seen anyone solve a Playfair by hand, or a vignette for that matter. Either you're the smartest mathematician we've seen in a decade, or you're trying to scam your way into this agency. Her tone of voice made it clear which she thought was the more likely. I didn't say anything. I assumed she could verify whether or not I had logged into the computer. Does that mean I don't get the job? As I already told you, that's not my decision to make. However, if my boss decides to make you an offer, that still doesn't guarantee you a job. All offers are conditional on passing the security check, which is no small hurdle. It requires a full lifestyle polygraph, psych exam, background investigation, the works. It can take at least six months for the paperwork to go through, and usually more like nine. It's a pain, too, I said. I went through it several years ago when my dad got me an internship at Lockheed Martin. The look she gave me was almost pleading. Are you telling me you already have a CSI security clearance? <laughs> well, it's lapsed, I said, but they can usually get those turned around in a week or so. And you didn't think that was worth mentioning on your resume. <laughs> I shrugged, feeling stupid again. I figured it wouldn't matter unless I got the job. Her gaze tried to dissect me. She seemed to think I was pulling a fast one over on her, but couldn't quite prove it. I'll pass on that information, along with my impressions of this interview. I warn you they will have your claims, all your claims, thoroughly investigated. It will probably take at least a week before you hear back one way or another. Fair enough, I said. I could feel the grin splitting my face, but I couldn't hold it back. I could tell that, although she didn't agree, she thought her superiors would make me an offer. I was going to work for the NSA. <laughs>